The lark in the morning, she rises off her nest. She goes home in the evening with the jewel on her breast. Unlike the jolly plowboy, she whistles and she sings. She goes home in the evening with the jewel on her wing. Ladies and gentlemen, you are very welcome to this fortnight's episode of the Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Club Bally Teague's Legion of Larks. This is a Paul Winters production, brought to you in association with our commercial partner, one of Ireland's fastest growing construction companies, Kildare's very own Kelby Development Limited. Each Kelby home is finished to the highest standard, which affords homeowners the luxury of modern living in superb locations. A heartfelt thank you to the beautiful Marie Gilligan for hosting us here tonight in the idyllic Traveller's Rest pub on the banks of the Grand Canal. Well, we're going outside the club and the parish for tonight's special guest, a sportsman who needs absolutely no introduction to our listeners, two times Irish Superstars champion, world superstars runner-up, champion trampolinist, three damn black belt, senior inter-county fitness coach, Tai Chi theorist, acupuncture and sports therapist. He is a man who has always walked amongst his own. He's Newbridge's very own Jerry Loftus. You're very welcome to the Fireside Chat, Jerry. Thank you very much, Alan. Lovely. Well, Ger, I always found a unique sense of camaraderie and identity amongst the people of Parkmurrah. What was it like growing up in Parkmurrah in the late 50s and early 60s? Well, I suppose at the time we wouldn't have any comparisons, but I can compare now. At that time, we were very close to nature. We invented things ourselves like rolling the wheel, or most guys had only a push bike. We had competitions all the time. Everybody, as far as I'm concerned, was fit. Everybody. Uh, parents, everything physical. Mother had five blankets on a bed or whatever. Uh, the lawn was done with a mower. The clippers was done with a physical clippers. It wasn't in the modern times of an engine just going, shoo, cutting everything or pushing everything without an effort. So if people were physically fitter then than they are in the modern times for that very reason. Uh, people, uh, of course, times at, uh, at that particular time and era, uh, there was one woman at home, which was your mother, and the father was out working. Uh, the boys all had to be innovative and creative, which was um, a bit of football out in the uh, Park Mirror Green. Uh, great camaraderie, great fun, great laughter. Modern times is technology. Technology is taken away from a human brain and it's creating a different type of a human than we have of, the, of that era. That's just the way life is. I mean, um, everybody says, well, it's not in your time. And that's a true statement. Our time was different than the time of today. Technology has taken over I and mean, they're turning into um, very much um, um, robotic situations. They're not allowed to use their own brains. Technology is creating everything for us. Whereas in our time, we actually created our own fun, laughter, and we were close to nature. Uh, we had three meals a day. We were glad of food. In the modern times, we seem to be throwing away a lot of food. Uh, yes, we might have more, and things are easier, but are they really? My point to that would be, we at one time were nomads, hands-on, physical people. Huge people. Then we saw a horse and there was horse and manpower. The first change of life was the agricultural revolution. And in that, people became very aware of what nature had and they could store it and harness it. And there was a, a, a great living then. And that was the biggest change in uh, nature of that particular time. But the biggest change of the lot, even for the modern era, was the um, industrial revolution. revolution. And the Industrial Revolution brought around because your man what created steam. Steam was harnessed, put in a machine, put into factories. Facto is to make in Latin. From that they made the textile industry and people thought that they would have a great living when they moved out from, we say, the, the land, which was all muck and dirt. But they thought they were going to have a great life. But as you well know, employers at that time and people who owned the business abused and used people like slavery, bad hours and bad money. So therefore they ended up with a lot of disease 
reformers were sent in to change the face of that time. And those reformers were changed it in this way. There was the first mention and the biggest change of life that we ever had, which was you're only allowed to work 12 hours a day instead of, legally, by the way, uh, instead of all hours that an employer would wish you to do. So legally speaking, you're only allowed to 12 hours. So they converted the other 12 into uh, time out to recover. And people at, at before this were dying at the age of 25 to 35. And orphans, we never heard of them before. But because of that situation, we had orphans. But because of the situation where, uh, and it was the first invention of time and change, which was public parks, public libraries and public swimming pools, people became fitter, healthier and more educated through the libraries, through the swimming and the parks. So they were healthier and brighter and more intelligent as time went on. People got better jobs because of that. Uh, and in time, people developed, and of course, uh, because of steam, as you well know, it developed machinery. So the likes of the physical well-being of a human being has changed and altered completely from very physiological into very technological, into right now a bigger change in the whole that, which is the robot revolution. And because of that, we are more looking into the hands on your hands. And what will happen there is that uh, because of that full change and cycle, that hand, manpower and horsepower have worked together for so long. Now it's the machine of manpower or horsepower. And horsepower and manpower are still working together, but in machinery. So all the work is making things lighter, faster and quicker. Uh, less physical for any human being. And therefore, it's redesigning the human as we know it. Brains are changing. Body uh, uh, strength is changing. And um, for instance, I'll just bring you back. My mother could wash dishes, uh, wash clothes, hand, uh, got the dinners, got everything ready. You ask anybody to do what she had done going back in time, they wouldn't be able to do it. You've re referred to your mother there, Jerry. <clears throat> Could you tell us about your two parents and the characteristics you would have inherited from both? Uh, my mother was a very, very strong woman, physically. And um, she would get up very early in the morning. And at that time, uh, in, in the 50s and 60s, <clears throat> we didn't have um, central heating. We had uh, briquettes and, 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 a, and a bit of coal, and a, a bit of wood to start it off. We didn't even have um, other ways of lighting fires. And whoever was first in the morning got down there to make those fires. And the porridge was on then, of course, or it was made the night before in case the range didn't heat up fast enough. Uh, we, the youth of today don't have the realisation of this survival. This was a, a real mode of survival for the life we had. But... Strangely enough, because we were actually surviving, we loved that survival. We, in the modern times, <clears throat> it isn't like that survival at all. In actual fact, we probably have too much of everything and never happy about it. In that time, we were happy for what we got. And then we grew alone in the back garden. Uh, and everybody helped out there. We had chickens and we dug up the garden. Everybody had a little job to do in the house. We had eight, eight in our house. People had eight to ten 12 in some houses but strangely enough even with that and, and very little money we survived immaculately yeah. my dad was a chef my dad was in the army yeah. that's when things changed for him and he was a chef in the army yeah. and um, he used to work as the race course for a secondary job or whatever the case may be or over in Lawler's Hotel over in Nace but he was a chef and um, between the mother and the father her strength and his character uh, that era <clears throat> will never be measured again in the same light. First of all, a woman was always in the house taking care of the emotional and the um, the day-to-day uh, -day goings on of all her children. The father, he was out in his strength and, uh, and, and his character to make money, to give to the household, to supply that energy, that money, which created all energy. It bought the brickets, it bought the coal, it bought the, the food. But um, between the two, they created family and uh, great roots. And because of that, we had morals and standards. And it was a kind of a peck and deck, like links of a chain. The father only looked with the mother. The mother was the king and the queen yeah. because she was strong. And to this day, that would have held strong because her emotional strength was far superior than a man's. A man didn't have to look after his emotional self. The mother did it. And that's why 
women were a lot stronger than a man emotionally. A man cannot handle emotion. But it's changing slowly and men or women becoming very alike. Why? Because of the meticulous work that both take up in computers and in, in, in meticulous work in, in uh, shops and housing and all that. So therefore, men and women are becoming very alike in everything that they create, everything in their workload, in, in their sharing. Uh, men as women, as well as women, have to look after their own children. Uh, it's just not one dimensional anymore. Even in sport, women are getting closer to men. So it shows you that we're being redesigned in time. What are your memories of school, Jerry? And who were your friends in those formative years? Um, I suppose we all create our own friends in our own area. I, I had a friend called John Harvey, <clears throat> and we became very close together. We played for Newbridge Town, actually. But there was always races on the school, and I did quite well in those, in the cross-country racing, in our bare feet, in the nettle fields. And, um, but I didn't like that, but that's what we did at the time, because we couldn't afford shoes. But, uh, or spikes, would I say, not shoes. But um, in saying that, in the earlier side of things, was we all had Gaelic football and soccer, or Gaelic football and uh, hurling uh, and running. They were the three things. And the actual organisation at the time was the NACA, the National Athletic and um, Cultural Association, or Cycling Association, my apologies. So a National Athletic and Cycling Association. And that only changed in later years to BLE, which is Board Lou Class Aaron. That became uh, the running and the organisation of Ireland. Um, whereas before that, it was the National Athletic and Cycling Association. Um, a different breed and a different culture and a different time. But as you know, all things change and never stay the same. And um, from that, when soccer came in first, it was hated. But at the end of the day, we have to move on with that. As being Irish people, we might like or dislike what happened in the past. But the truth is, if you want a future, you, have to, you can't live in the past, in my personal view. You're constantly evolving, Jerry. I'm constantly evolving and changing, and I did too. And from that period of time, it gave me a great strength and st steely. Um, we, we competed all the time. Not, not in competitions uh, that were created. We created them. We went out for football on the, on the, uh, on, on, on the uh, pitch that was outside in Park. Everybody played football. Everybody played with a bit of hurling. We had fun and games all the time, but we were all physical and movement. I'll take you back to that green in Park mm. late 50s, early 60s, Jerry. Who were your sporting heroes of the time? Um, I never really followed sport personally. Um, but... I suppose from a local level, you've seen great guys who played football. There was Tom Kyo down the bottom of the road, very talented guy, played with his left and right foot. But he would have reminded you of Kevin Keegan was the man at the time. Yeah. There's, and I did like him. He was a very talented guy. <clears throat> he had long hair, I was a member. And, and so did most of our people in that era. Um, there was uh, um, Christy Mead. Christy was one of the best full backs out of anywhere. There was... Um, Nicky Lee, he was talented. There was John Sherlock, the goalkeeper. But all of those guys had, had a massive impact on the way soccer was developed in Newbridge with Newbridge Town. And I actually uh, played with the, um, the juveniles. And we won a Leinster Junior League, one of the first to break Dublin. And, of course, when we went to Dublin, they hated us because we were culchies. <laughs> and, of course, they slagged us off because they never liked being beaten by the culchies. Right. But we did have a, a fantastic... Um, uh, homely feeling about Park Murray. Most of Newbridge Town was Park Murray. Park Murray. Yeah. And that developed outside of that. We had a great, um, if you like, alignment with the likes of Pierce Town. There was great footballers over in Pierce Town. Great bunch of lads, tough as nails. And we were in the middle because our fathers were tough as nails as well. But yeah. we, we were known to be, not to be pushed around. Pushed we were tough, yeah. but we were... Uh, we wanted to be educated as well. Lovely. You joined the Defence Forces then after your education and school. How did the Army assist in your development, both as a person and an athlete? Well, I would say that the Army doesn't suit everybody, number one. And in that era, which was 74 that I joined, times were tough for Uncle there. Jobs were, were minimum. Mm -hmm. Um... Uh, I, 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 I had hair down to my butt. I was a bit of a hippie. And people were surprised that I even joined the army. 
Um, to be quite honest, it wasn't what I really wanted. But at the time, my father was in the army. My two brothers had went to the army. And um, I just said, I had nothing else to do. I may join. So I did join. And in saying that, I have to say, uh, even though I was a very disciplined person, because my dad was an army head anyway, um, I liked hard work. I was a very physical guy. And I got on, fitted in at a level. And um, I got best soldier. And they wanted me to do things with that, go through the ranks and things. I wasn't prepared, it really wasn't my thing. And I never thought any further than just being a soldier. But then I got to the gym. And in the gym then I learned many uh, modalities like gymnastics, mm -hmm. athletics, badminton. Um, uh, the trampoline. Won, the trampoline was a big thing with me, yeah. I won uh, the, the army trampoline and an, uh, I won an open Irish competition in trampoline outside of it. And then came along because of that a man called Colonel Hegarty asked me would I um, go into the superstars and represent mm -hmm. the army and Ireland. And right. I did so in 1980. I think was, and um, sorry. Well, you f you found the fame through the superstars, Jerry. Would it be fair to say it was the ultimate test of an athlete's, let's say, all round ability, given all the various disciplines? And for our younger listeners, could you just give an insight to all the disciplines, the stars? Yeah, it would be actually an excellent um, uh, competition in modern times, and mainly because. Uh, the youth of today have moved indoor a lot in the likes of rowing machines, treadmills, yeah. bicycles. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's just the way life has moved on. At the time, when I grew up in Park Murray, as you asked, we ran, cycled. We had horse jumps when we saw the horses every year in uh, the Aga Cans um, up in Dublin for the RDS, actually. And we'd all be jumping. So we had all those traits. And they came, and I... I would uh, put a swing on the on the tree outside my place, which was about 20 metres off the ground. So I had to climb the tree and put on that uh, rope, climb down it, and we had great fun on that. We had every year, we had massive um, organisation with maybe five, ten people, and we used to have games and sports and competitions at everything we done, but it was only personal. And from that, when I joined the army, it put all that together. And I became a bit of an all-rounder. So I was good at cycling, swimming, uh, running, obstacle course, uh, which the army gave me, gave me an opportunity to uh, demonstrate my strengths all around. And from that, we had courses which developed that, which were um, unarmed co uh, combat courses. We had PTI courses. We had um, gymnastic courses. We had all sorts of courses. And I have to say, the best coaches I ever met were army coaches of that era. Why? Because every one of them could do exactly as they demonstrated. If you wanted a gymnast, he could show you a back flick, a back somersault, he could give you a demonstration, whereas eventually courses were demonstrated by people who just wanted to do courses. But at that time, we had the elite people doing courses to give a demonstration of their own natural skills. It's not an overstatement, Jerry, to say that in the early 80s, 1982, 1983, you were the fittest athlete in Ireland and one of the fittest athletes in the world. What sort of records did you break at the time in terms of push-ups and chin-ups? The first things that uh, were uh, was the chin-ups record. Yeah. Um, now, um, chin-ups and squat thrusts were combined together and I was never ever beaten in them by anybody. Uh, there was one or, one or two guys who were quite good uh, and one of them was actually Declan Burns, very good at chin-ups, but I could always beat him in the combination of both. Um, Declan, it was his forte, and I'm fair to him, very good at it. But my forte wasn't just that. I was a very good all-round athlete. I honed my skills into that. I was very fast, very explosive. I could play basketball, football. I could cycle very well. Uh, I cycled with clubs, and they said I could, maybe if I'd done a lot, lot of work, I could be a cyclist. Um, I didn't know my distance in running really, even though I had run different races. I ran 52 seconds for uh, four, 400 metres on the track. As time transpired, I ran eight seconds over four minutes for a mile and around 30 minutes for a 10k uh, and around 52 minutes for a uh, 10 mile. I could always account all the times and um, 
68-69 then for a half marathon and I, that evolved and I was a bit unfortunate I could have run a lot better in the marathon which would have ran 228 and I could tell people how to train now because of the mistakes I made I ran 228 but I probably wasn't ready at that moment to do what I did and I walked four miles and I always said I'd love to have gone back and I was 39 years of age at that time so if I had brought myself back and you asked me what would I do differently I would have trained maybe for three or four years extra to do what I'd done there and I know I would have went really way under 220 in my head. How many chin-ups could you do in a minute, Jerry? Uh, I done. I remember I done a, a charity thing down in Cork and done 60 but um, they wouldn't accept it because uh, in the Guinness Book of Records even though Jimmy McGee was there, Timex was there, the Lord Mayor was there but they wouldn't accept it because there wasn't a representative from the Guinness Book of Records but I done 61 or two that day. Uh, push-ups? Uh, no, chin-ups. Chin-ups, but how many push-ups? Push-ups, uh, I used to be able to do over 100, yeah, in a minute. I'd done a, a thing on Las Vegas with the Jimmy Gee All-Stars, and Jimmy asked me what I'd do, 30 seconds. I'd done 66 in 30 seconds. God, that's... Um, some of the best athletes, Jerry, in the world competed in superstars. You mentioned Kevin Keegan, <clears throat> Joe Fraser. <clears throat> Who were your main competitors of the time? Um, well, in Ireland, um, Bernard Brogan was there, and his sons actually were very famous afterwards for the same reason he was for footballer. Mm-hmm. Bernard was a very talented guy, lovely guy too, I might add. Uh, Barney Rock was there, um, Jack O'Shea was there, um, um, Declan Burns. Declan Burns, mentioned? of course, yeah. yeah. And uh, Canoe was Declan, was he? He was, yeah, yeah, and represented Ireland in the Olympics. Um, all really well honed athletes. Um, Alan Bates of course again he was another canoeist so um, from there you got an opportunity to represent Ireland and I won it twice in a row I was a bit unlucky in the third year I only lost by two and a half points or whatever but I was a bit unlucky I fell in the obstacle course normally would get a few points there that's all I would have needed but in saying that um, I was a trampoline I didn't really mind I I had my moment and um, all I wanted to ever do was do the best I could which I did it must have been a great experience representing your country in Florida. And how did you deal with the heat? Uh, probably, genuinely saying it now, it affected me badly. I, I, I didn't feel comfortable. I trained and I'd done the best I could, but no one can... You know, it's like if you watch the Olympics this year, um, they all were way down in their times. That's the way heat affects people. And if you go down through history even of GAA... There was times that they were, were taking time out for water in very warm days. But in saying that, you do the best you can. No excuses. Everybody's under the same uh, 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 rules and guidelines, heat or otherwise. But when I went to uh, Key Biscay in Florida, uh, a bit unlucky in one or two events. Uh, I could have done a little bit better, but that's okay. And the following year, I did make up for that. And I was second in Hong Kong in 1983. And... Um, um, I was beaten by the British athlete at the time, but I gave him a run for his money. I was happy with that. Excellent. And for myself, no one encapsulated the beauty of growing up in Allen View Heights in the 80s, like Jerry Loftus. The 80s there were a decade, um, a difficult decade economically, Jerry, and Superstars, as you know, was a massive TV show. You gave us a great sense of identity. I remember going into school, that was our neighbour there from Allen View Heights. And were you aware at the time the major impact you were having on the town in Newbridge and how much you actually meant to the people? No, you never would because you're that focused yeah. on trying to put time into everything that you do that it's not, you don't have that outward experience, that uh, disassociation of being who you are to what we perceive perception of people have of you but what you would have you would meet people and they would always have a smile for them and they'd say how are you going and they'd be delighted you could see that there was a, a recognition there straight away and they were delighted that you were local and that you were representing them and fellas would say it here at times and people would say it here at times i got freedom in Ubridge one time because of the whole situation and whatever that means i don't know by the way <laughs> Do you pay for the pay parking? Uh, oh, you still pay for it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you shouldn't. Have I think it was meals for the boys. 
<laughs> well, Jimmy McGee once said, I remember reading it in the Sunday World, that Jerry Loftus has three things going for him. He's good legs, great lungs and a magnificent willpower. Did you work a lot on honing that mental strength? No, I'd say that's developed from your parents. Um, it's either in you or it's not. And uh, my father was a very good worker. And I took that from him because he aligned himself with me at times when I was out working for him, part-time work, he'd incorporate me and bring me into the mix. And I learned from him. And it has stood to me in time with the work I do now. Uh, and that, which is, I'm an acupuncture, sports therapist, hypnotherapist, reflexology, kinesiology. I never stop learning. And if you never stop learning, every day you will learn something. It mightn't be anything like someone mentioned the vagus nerve. But the vagus nerve, strangely enough, is our parasympathetic relaxation. But where it is and to use it is what people don't know. But I have studied it to now to realise that I can be of great help to people who have anxiety and stress. And of course, uh, hypnotherapy helps that too. And CBT talking and NLP, they're all talking things. But... Only at a level can you help everybody. You need to be open-minded. Uh, no one modality suits everybody. Yeah. And that's great to have so many modalities. And I'll never stop learning. And like all the traits I had as an all round athlete, I also have that with my treatments. And that stands to me for good results. I spend an hour with people, which is very honest. And um, I only charge 50 euros for each treatment. And to me, it is a treatment. I'm given, now I'm giving back something. Yeah. I'm still healthy, strong, um, I'm nearly 67 years of age next month. I'm healthy, strong, vibrant, and still have a great motivation. I train every day, still run around at 67, uh, 20 minutes for a, a 5K, you know. The aforementioned Jimmy McGee, he was a great friend of yours, Jerry, and a considerable chapter, paragraph of a chapter in his autobiography dedicated to you. Jimmy McGee was a national treasure. Can you give us an insight into what made him such a beautiful person? Jimmy McGee was in a right place at the right time. At that time and era, uh, Jimmy had all his own stuff to, to create the work that he was involved with, which was interviewing. And he travelled the whole world numerous times. And he was in every arena, every Olympics, every World Championships, every Gaelic game. So Jimmy had many, many serious years of constant movement, education and learning within the interviewing uh, creativity of who Jimmy McGee was. On, a on a, an honest level, I always got on well with Jimmy McGee. Uh, I always got on well with Sean Boylan, actually, another guy who I have great admiration for. But Jimmy was a very straightforward guy, um, very bright and intelligent man, and his wife was a beautiful person, I might add, and I always clicked with them. Uh, and it was a man called Justin Nelson as well. He was the um, <clears throat> the producer. But I always got on great with these people. And um, there was a little incident actually with Jimmy and his wife. And his wife said to me when we were in Hong Kong, he says, um, Jimmy's going to ask you to lift these bags, Jerry. And they're all full of silk shirts. He loves these shirts. When he asks you, you say, no, I'm too tired. I won't be lifting them, Jimmy. So Jimmy came up to me at one stage there and he called me, Jerry, um, he was pushing on his glasses. Said, Will you lift me bags for me? And I couldn't. I, I nearly wanted to burst out laughing because I, I wasn't serious when I said it. But I did turn around. No, I'm not lifting your bags for you, Jimmy. Lift them yourself. I'm too tired. And I went around the corner and I burst out laughing. And Jimmy stood there in stunned amazement that I said no. <laughs> Everybody else seemingly said yeah. And uh, he came around the corner and he saw me laugh. And he says, they had you up to it. They had you up to it. And his wife came around. Yeah, I told him. And he was... He started laughing, but he, he was stunned that I said no to him. Lovely. I'll tell you a good story. I was I was waiting for a train in Turles. <clears throat> I had an hour to kill, so I went into the town and there was matches on. It was Wednesday night. I went in, just had a couple of pints there waiting on the train and got talking to the barman and uh, didn't recognise him, but he, uh, he asked me where was I from and I said Newbridge. And he just lit up. How's Lofty? How's Lofty? And um, I said, Lofty, Jerry, Jerry Lofty. So I said, yeah, Jerry's going well. And I hadn't been there. I was talking to you about a week beforehand. You know? I said, Jerry's flying. Turned out it was Seamus Darby. 
Oh, who's, Seamus Darby. He, oh, scored, guy. he scored the winning goal to stop the five in a row against Kerry, as everyone would know. But um, he said to me, I'll be back to you later. I'll tell you about the Vegas trip. That's right. Myself and Jerry were on. But the train intervened and I never got to... That's so hear the story. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that at all, Jerry? It might be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you what happened anyway, just for it's so many years ago. And this is the truest thing that ever happened. No, maybe I won't. No, 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 no. I'm only hang myself. But I have to say, I was short of a few, Bob, and I, and I, I, I Seamus said to me that, listen, Jerry, I have loads of money with me, and here's the ones you can give it to me when you go back home. There's no problem. And he did. And um, we went out that night, and we had a great night. And um, Johnny Peters was there as well. And Jimmy was out that night. And um, it was the Jimmy Gee All-Stars. And we had a great night in Las Vegas. And I met Brendan Boyer. And that's the night I'd done the 30 seconds. Jimmy asked me would I do the Las Vegas American and Irish world record <laughs> on the press-ups press, on the press ups for 30 seconds. And on that stage, I did 66 in 30 seconds. And... Um, I walked on my hands on it, actually, which I could do at the time. I walked on my hands onto the stage, and then I was wearing a suit, which you wouldn't be in Las Vegas, but I was. I was nearly sliding over it. But Jimmy made a big deal of it, and we all had a great night. And that's what Seamus was talking about. And Seamus Darby, I have to say, for anybody who's listening, was a beautiful guy. Very honest on that trip, very straightforward. And I also met uh, Father Brian Darcy and Michael Cleary. And I have to say... Two of the nicest people I have ever met. They're very straightforward, very honest, and um, do not um, classify anybody. They're just who they are themselves. You left the army, Jerry, while it was compatible fit for you from a fitness mm. facilities and, let's say, a disciplinary perspective. Maybe there wasn't a cultural fit in the sense that you were someone who devoted your life to evolving to learning, to innovation, and probably to questioning things, rather than someone that took direction. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, that would be very fair to say. Yeah, I, even though I joined the army, I was a very individual guy. I got best soldier, best shot, best kid. I, 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 um, I wasn't led. I can't be led. I'd have to ask questions. Why do we do this and why do we do that? And uh, some people might take that as a kind of arrogant or, 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 or brash or any of that. It's not. It's just who you are, and you're entitled to be who you are. And um, anybody who knows me knows I won't be led, and I won't be pushed around or ever bullied in my life by anybody. Either that or you better fear for your own life. And that brings me on to the next question. You've always been, for me, years ahead of mainstream society. Um, you were credited as being the first physical trainer to introduce intensive warm-ups for football teams you feel the establishment were suspicious of you as you didn't conform and tick a lot of boxes yeah i'm not actually going to elaborate on it but i yeah. could and i could write a book on it no they didn't like me because number one at that era of time army officers were the main guy and they really didn't like a guy like me to have made it because if they did they would have made more more of me in the gymnasium uh, as somebody to go and learn from. But they didn't because I wasn't an army officer. And for that reason, uh, an actual fact, I will say this because I should have said it years ago. They brought me into a room and told me that my status was above theirs when I think of leaving the army. And from that moment of time, let me say this in an honest way. I don't mind saying it now. Uh, I was barred out of the gym for training in the gymnasium on a Saturday or Sunday. And I won't say who by, so I won't name names, but if this is the truth, this God may strike me dead. Um, and I've no reason, I should have said it years ago, should have went to the papers about it, but they actually barred me from going to the gym uh, and training on a Saturday or Sunday. Yet I could train 30 men on my own, but they wouldn't allow me to go into the gymnasium on a Saturday or Sunday, which limited my advancement and creativity. Your training schedules. Um, and they had a bit of a chip on the shoulder about that, I think. And I don't think, I know. And that's what they said to me on that particular occasion, uh, that they felt my status was above theirs. That states it all. Instead of enhancing who I was and the ability that I had and keeping me in the gymnasium and encouraging young people to come to that area and join up the army, no. Yeah. It was trying to get rid of me. Yeah. I always felt Jerry Loftus, and it, 
if there is such a thing as these peers, should be employed by the Department of Education to go around the schools, especially now we're dealing with obesity, suicides, bullying, etc., just to work on the physical and mental development of students. 100%. And, yeah, and somebody that has my experience would be able to lighten up people as regards bullying, as regards um, standing up for ourselves, as regards racism. I have no time for it. Um, I think everybody, uh, we're all humans. We're all entitled to our space. We have, a good, we have a heart which ticks like everybody else's. We have a world in which we all have to contend with. We have to live with it. We have to get employment. We have to start at the bottom. We have to have a step-by-step programme like being on the base of a ladder. If you have no skills, you have to gain skills. That's what I've learned in this world. And the more you keep working at it, the better you will become and the more successful you will become. What do you think of modern Ireland, Jerry? Modern Ireland? Mm. Well, you see, looking at it from my perspective, we have advanced in many ways, but went backwards in a lot of ways. Uh, we've lost nature and our touch of it. And it should be in schools. Uh, most, and, and a lot of things that should be in schools that are not in schools um, should be the education of the mind. Uh, mindfulness. Uh, um, on strategies to against anxiety and stress. Bullying at a very early stage should be t- taken note of. And it is a massive thing and people plamossed it and, and pushed it under the um, blankets. But it's there and it's still there. And I have met people who have left school and were still bullied. I met a man a few years ago uh, in a certain job and he was telling me about his situation but the man took his life. And afterwards it was shown that his co-workers were bullying him. Now that wouldn't happen to me because I'm too strong. Somebody would pay the price of that bullying. And uh, it wouldn't matter whether you were bigger or stronger than me. you get something over the head. Uh, that's just the way it is. No, it is. But some people are not that strong. But I was uh, born into a, 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 with eight people, six boys and two girls. Mm-hmm. And we had to stand our ground. And there was morals and standards in that family. Mm-hmm. And there was um, a strength amongst each individual and, and a pecking deck yeah. that the older one, you would never cross his path. We never had to contend with adults because we never, we never uh, would have crossed our path. But before that ever happened, the eldest in the house would have stopped you dead. Yeah. And yeah. I hit you a clip in the ear I might add. Well, you allude there to the leadership within the house with your parents and the leadership in society politically. What are your views on the political leaders of today? Um, As as a political uh, podium, I wouldn't have anything to say about these people. They're very intelligent and bright people. Mm -hmm. But as leadership qualities, they wouldn't be in the same field as I would. I couldn't have them. They, to me, are not leaders of this country. Anybody that speaks negative and calls himself a leader of anybody is not a leader. And I don't like, I did not like the way uh, our leader stood and explained what a, the COVID was all about and what we had to do. You don't tell people to hide under a rock and fight something. Let me simplify it. If the Brits came tomorrow to Wexford and said they were going to take over my country, I'd be first lined up to make sure that I stopped them in Wexford and they wouldn't go a step further. So we have a pandemic which was in Wuhan in China. And the first thing that were spoke to us about, it was in the children of Ireland, and they carry it. How did it jump the people of Ireland and go to the children of Ireland was my first question. And what that done was put a barrier between families and people, taking this man at his word. What kind of a leader talks negative like that? And then they took them out of hospitals. What type of leader does such a thing like that? Why didn't he put them in the city west? And then we had a situation where... The chilling factory and factories like it. Why didn't they close down those factories instead of closing down the whole legal air and putting people out of business and jobs? Yeah. We haven't seen the full extent of this. And these are only touching on things that I feel that, you know, are honest. It's not being political. It's just being honest. And you're passionate about it. Oh, I'm very passionate about it. I, I, I feel that we, are, we haven't started to pay the price of this. And uh, I, as I said, 
Mr. Vadiker and, 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 and Michal, uh, possibly love, lovely people. It's nothing to do with that. But if you're not a good leader, how do you expect to walk onto a football pitch and inspire people? Imagine me asking him on his first uh, oration to come down to a local camogie team and speak like that. How many people would you beat? You'd be crying going home. Because he could not inspire me or motivate me in any stretch of the imagination. So whoever thinks that he's a leader is widely mistaken. He might be a good political man, but he is not a good leader. As you know, we're a GA podcast. And Jerry, you've worked as a physical trainer under two of the greatest GA managers of all time, Sean Boylan and Mick O'Dwyer. How did both men differ in their approach? Sean Boylan is a man's man. What I mean by that is that he knows how to deal with it. My father could do it, actually. My father was a man's man. He knew how to handle people that came looking for a loan or a few bob or whatever the case may be in simplicity. And he knew right well that he wouldn't be uh, foolish enough to think that if he didn't get it back, that he wouldn't give that person more money. My dad was liked by people because he was a man's man. He knew how to mix it at the level that it was at that was safe for him, that he wouldn't get stung. Now, Sean Boylan... Sean Boylan was a very creative man, a very positive man. His father, of course, was in the IRA and for skirmishes in Bambayna, I might add. Mm. His father was a true leader. Uh, and if you read, anybody reads his book, you would see where Sean got it from. But he has this thing that comes from him, an energy source. And he has great respect for everybody, himself and everybody, not just himself. Sean Boylan could stand anywhere. And I remember the first time I met him, actually, uh, and it's good to note this. He said to me, come down next week, Jerry, and I'll introduce you to the team so that you'll be training them. He hired me as a coach. There was a young lad there that day, and he said, how are you, Jerry? But he bypassed me for a second, and he said to the young lad, Jesus, it's great to see you here, son. I think we were playing a challenge match with somebody. And he says, um, are you down here to watch the team? Do you follow the team? Oh, yeah. He says, yes. He says, you go down that pitch there, and when the game starts, I'll be down, and I'll have a chat with you. That, to me, says it all. And he says to me, Jerry, come on in, we'll introduce you to the team. And that said an awful lot about a guy who's a leader. And that's what I'm talking about, leadership qualities. He had this leadership quality about himself. He made you feel good. He made you stand up. That's what real leaders are about. They don't talk negative. No matter what situation, you do not talk negative. And that's what we were getting going back off these leaders that we were so-called had. Negative, negative, negative. You cannot speak to a nation with negativity if you want them to move on. Mick O'Dwyer. Different class of a man altogether. Uh, in saying anything about any of these people, it's nothing personal, it's just my perspective of life itself. Uh, Mick was a different kettle of fish. Um, he trained people the way he wanted to train them. Sean gave everybody their job. Sean, if I had a problem, he would say to me, would you mind if I take the boys? Mikko, on the other hand, would take the boys. Mm. I didn't like that because you hired me to do a job. You should have allowed me to do my job. And I was doing a great job with those people, but he took them off me, point blank. Mm. And I seen them going down and I, I didn't like what I saw. I went to the county board about it, actually. And I explained to them that you will not beat anybody with the training you're doing with a bunch of lads that you have. I trained them like the 300 strong. And that's the way I would train any team who has not got all the cogs in a wheel, who has not got all the talented people that you need to be winners. What you could be is put a dent in anybody that comes towards you, that you're tough, hardy, strong, and will last the full 70 minutes. If you cannot last 70 minutes of football, there's something wrong with your strength, stamina, and endurance. I've been an athlete all my life to know the difference. And if there's something wrong with your speed, well, then you need to put that in the mix as well. I mean, the components of fitness are strength, stamina, speed, supplements and skill. If you don't understand them, you shouldn't be training somebody. You need to define each one. That's why I was a good coach. I could define each one, understand them, and deliver that in a step-by-step programme. Yeah. Of all of the Gaelic footballers you trained, who was the best athlete? I would say, for different reasons... Um, I like Hank Trainer for a different reason. Strong, never gives up. Uh, Graham Gerty was probably one of the most elusive footballers I've ever seen. Graham takes his time, doesn't get involved, goes around the place, looks at you, 
looks at you up and down, but you just don't know what he's going to do. He's a natural predator. And um, Trevor Giles. Trevor was a, a natural athlete as well. Trevor showed his prowess. He was very talented, but a different kettle of fish altogether. Uh, and two completely different people. But put them on a team together, they were amazing. And that's what putting a team together is all about. And Sean Boylan could put a team together. But he uh, enhanced your way of thinking. He Mikko, actually built two teams to... to oh, yeah, absolutely. Ours. Mikko would put a team together the way he felt the team should be. Um, and that was his way of doing something. Highly successful, all the same. Oh, highly successful. And you yeah. had not the man for that whatsoever. But he came into a different era and he wouldn't have that same success, as you know yourself. Yeah. He was highly successful when he had a very successful team. team. He, was, he walked into a team that was self-driven, who ate footballs for their breakfast. Same mm-hmm. as says of Kilkenny. Of Tipperary, I was down there looking at these young people coming with their hurlies every day. Well, Kerry was like that, and Mikko got a hold of them and trained them and done exceptionally with them. Yeah. Uh, but when he everybody caught up in the game of running, as you know yourself, he was going backwards. Yeah. So he had his time, he had his era, and highly successful and fair play to yeah. him, uh, a highly successful uh, manager. We bring it forward to the current day, Jerry. You have a very successful and well-renowned sports therapy practice in Newbridge. For a lay person like myself and our listeners, what's the difference between that and traditional physiotherapy? First of all, um, you have to take everything and change it or alter it in some way to advance forward. One time, uh, a hamstring was probably a, the giggly pin in the human body that didn't even know what it was. Education was a big thing. And then there was no need for an awful lot of therapists years ago because we had very diverse forms of work between tilling the land, yeah. uh, plucking the berries, plucking the apples from the ceiling, and then uh, plucking the spuds off the ground. We had actually natural physical therapy. But like grassroots soccer or gaily, it came from playing in Park Murray to put now into Ryan's field. So grassroots had to be, because we didn't do it anymore, because uh, technology was taken over, people were getting uh, more working hours, longer hours. They didn't have that time to put into playing outside their houses anymore. So it was brought then to grassroots football and grassroots training. And uh, from that, we developed into the modern era of uh, strength conditioning, the components of fitness, strength, stamina, speed, stuff and skill. Put yourself in the centre. What are you? Are you a footballer or do you want to build up your body? So you must know uh, of all these. And they have all developed in time. Uh, has time been kind? It's just built a different type of, of human being. That's all. You've developed your own style of Tai Chi. Mm. Could you give us an insight into what Tai Chi is and how it helps the whole rehabilitation process? Well... Going back to the point before that, uh, my therapy, I spend one hour in therapy. I'm getting very good results for that because I, I know at this stage, because I've never stopped learning, I know the human body like a surgeon. Uh, I know every articulate part of a human body as in anatomy, as in the skeletal system, the muscular system, the neurological system. As you know, I'm a personal trainer. From that, I, I trained Bernard Dunn one time, who was a world-renowned boxer. Um, as you know, I was three years with Sean Boylan and I trained his, uh, he, gave them personal training. And I was with the leash team for a year and I had to give individuals uh, an insight into how to develop their own strength and skills. Now, going back into uh, my um, modalities that I've learned, I'm an acupuncture, sports therapist, hypnotherapist, reflexology, kinesiology and um, CBT and LLP. I have came across, they're not no good to anybody. If you're not confident and furthermore if you're not a good listener because if you listen to your client they'll tell you exactly what's wrong so if you know the human body like the surgeon you know exactly where that is i cannot heal someone that has structural uh, damage but i can heal anybody with ligament sinew tissue and i can also guide them better because i'm a personal trainer than most people 
Um, and I also do acupuncture, which works on the neurological system. Mm -hmm. And it's not trigger pointing. Trigger pointing is sticking needles into the belly and muscle and twiddling it. That is not acupuncture. I want people to know this. Acupuncture had 5,000 years of learning. You don't go in in three weekends like tr uh, uh, trigger pointing and tell me you know all about the human body all of a sudden and stick needles in them. That's an insult to anybody, really. Mm -hmm. uh, a mockery, really, in my eyes, to the Chinese people. Because why? You can't learn something in three weekends, never mind uh, massage or anything else. It takes years to be a coach. It takes years to be a talented guy. It takes years to be in the Olympics. It doesn't take two days and three weeks and five. It takes years. You want to be good at what you do? Keep learning it. And be open-minded about it. You're still the same well-chiseled Jerry Loftus that I knew growing up as a child. What's your average daily training routine or regime? Possibly I had nurtured it down to an hour and a half. I would run anything up to 10k. Um, and I, when I get my injuries, I look after myself to acupuncture, cup and heat um, and my modality. I never had to see anybody and I wasn't, I was, I'm glad about that because most modalities require a half an hour. How I've stayed in good contact or a good nick is because I work from a neurological perspective and if people want to understand what that means, put your foot in the nail and what happens? Your brain tells you to move. So we work on a sensory and motor division straight from the cerebrum of the brain and the spinal cord. They're our control centers. What do they control? They control everything in the human body, every function in the human body. So let no one be disillusioned. If it doesn't function from the brain, it doesn't function in your body. Your heart doesn't just function. The vagus nerve is its function, which emulates from the brain itself. The trigeminal nerve from the brain travels down through the body with the spinal cord via the peripheral nervous system and that's how we function through sensory and motor even internally when you get a pain how do you know the nerve is sending the, 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 the message back that you have a pain so we're working on sensory and motor i keep myself fit looking after myself number one educate myself number two running up to 10k a day as easy as i can i, I don't run as you fast still as do I can. gym work i still do gym work i do press-ups chin-ups all of that type of thing yeah, I keep myself in good nick that way. And another time I get, if I have an injury, I look after myself. And I'm still able to do the physical, even though I might not be able. If I had, uh, or if I, if I was to give advice to people, if you're injured, especially from a skeletal point of view, which is a structural point of view, get into water. It's non-weight bearing. Lose the attitude. If you, if you have an attitude about how you look and an ego, you're never going to be happy because... Who cares what someone sees a few pounds in you, your arse sticking out through your, your trousers? What you need is to be powerful in your brain. Don't worry about them. Don't even think about them. Go out and do your workouts for you. It'll make you feel 100% better than the human just to be physically fit, to run up and down a swimming pool. Not swimming. You don't have to swim to be fit. That's a mythical thing. If you want to swim, I'm not knocking it. But you're not a, a tadpole and a shark. You're a human. And you have to run for the bus and walk for it. It wasn't all training either, Jerry. You were known to have an occasional drink and the occasional visit to the dance floor with your renowned wingman, the legendary disco barber himself, Nolly Redmond. That's how, right. how important is the downtime, Jerry? One thing I have learned. You have to take time out. I don't care who you are or how, what you are, because you will wind up yourself up completely, mentally and physically. And in the modern world, completely with technology, that's what's happening. And people have more mental problems than have physical problems. But it will manifest itself physically if you don't address the mental and mindfulness. Yeah. Now, there's so many areas in there. You, not everybody can help everybody. Again, saying the same thing. We have all different modalities, but you need to choose wisely. And if you're not getting what you're off one person, Somebody down the road can give you what you want. Don't be negative. Don't say no one can help you. Somebody out there can help you. Even your buddy on the first trademark of if you looked at your pal and he's not happy, help him out. Have names in your phone. See these people. I'll go with you. Back up your friends when you have mindfulness, where you have a problem with your mind. It might be something in the past. It might be your present mode. That's why good friends are important. Genuine good friends. Noli was a good buddy with me. He was the barber in the back street for a long time. He has moved out. Of course, we went to the disco, had a few pints, and that's very important. Let yourself go now and again. Let yourself lose. That 
You need to get rid of it and wind Pharaohs down. Pharaohs did you no harm, Ger. Pharaohs did me no harm whatsoever. It was a great bit of crack. I met some great characters there, including yourself, Al. <laughs> <laughs> and Noli. How does Noli stay so trim? Was it a training regime or...? Ah, Noli uh, did a little bit of cycling, even though and he walked most places. He didn't mm -hmm. um, get transport um, and kept himself reasonably well. And I think that anybody that, um, as you know yourself, Al, uh, life really changed when the smoking went. A lot of characters that were in pubs smoked and drank. When I mean, they couldn't smoke, they didn't want to be in the pub. They were uh, Shanna Keys and people who were funny, were, yeah. were educated, were good men. But that's yeah. the life that they learned was about being in a pub, sitting down, a fag to relax themselves, a little beer. What I believe that society changed from that moment on. And then um, the characters weren't the same type of character anymore. And... Yeah. Um, the music has even changed. It's not the same type of music anymore. The youth of today are more into technological, musical stuff, enhanced by technology. Your voice is not good enough anymore. It has to be enhanced by something else. Growing up in Allen View Heights, I was quite fortunate to be friendly with all your children and the most beautiful family anyone mm. could meet. Could you tell us about them, Jerry? We'd start with the eldest, Denise. Denise, 43 now. Yeah. Denise is... Um, has her own individuality, probably were very alike like that. Uh, went on to be an acupuncturist and um, working away still. Um, has a great brain in which she, if she wishes to use it, she can use it. She may not, but she has that opportunity. It's like having talent. You either use it or you don't. You might not have a musician to use it. You might not even want to use it. I've met many guys who had very talented guys, but they just had no drive and motivation and focus. You need those traits if you and determination. If you want to be... Uh, a top class in anything or successful in anything. A great brass player writes her own poetry. Oh, absolutely. Denise is a saxophone, um, the shillelagh, or shillelagh, whatever you call it. What's it uh, what was that yeah. small little thing? Uh, well, and the guitar. Ukulele. Now. She, the ukulele, sorry. And uh, Denise was always poetic. Now she's writing music. But she could write poems one time. And I got her to write out for my, my, my brother Peter, actually, for me, and she was yeah. excellent at it. Um, but now she's developing from that. And um, she's happy, yeah. uh, has a house. And then there's uh, Geraldine would have been next. And some wit. Uh, Geraldine's very fast, very quick <laughs> and very witty. Um, works with autistic children, has done so for many, many years. Happy in the capacity of that. She could have changed and authored herself, could have done many things. Good brain as well. But Geraldine chooses that and she does courses within that mm. uh, field and very happy. Then you're on to Shawnee. Now, Geraldine was competitive at the Camogie. Oh, wasn't Camogie. She? Geraldine did kill you on the pitch. <laughs> they had that streak. <laughs> we go on to Sean. What a singer. <laughs> Sean went into three um, scholarships for opera. Yeah. Uh, was on the Dublin circuit and had made money there when he went in advancement of that. Has a Bachelor of Arts degree in genetics. He was uh, a good brain. Um, it's, it's funny enough, has never used it in that capacity yeah. because he went and wanted to be an opera singer. He, from the money he gained from Dublin, Shawnee went uh, to um, uh, New York and he stayed with my brother Paul. Mm -hmm. So he was, he was lucky. And he stayed there for about three years till he ended up and done a show in Broadway. But they had to make a decision then. And going back in a little bit of time there, Shawnee actually opened the art centre with um, Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat. Yeah, yeah. Shawnee actually, on that first night of opening, sang Joseph uh, in, in the operatic scene and played the part. So he had good acting ability. Now I have to say, Skull and Mirror was responsible for a lot, of, a lot of them, giving them the opportunity. I will have to mention that. Skull and Mirror was a magnificent school. We, we all had somebody there. The school yeah. teachers were magnificent. I actually worked there myself in the capacity of coach and teacher to the kids. And I have to say, they were beautiful kids. I had a great time there. And even when I went back to college, when I went back, my computer skills were crap. And I have to say, uh, the, the ones in the school mm -hmm. taught me how to get over the computers when I went back to college myself. You must be so proud of Sean there, Jordan Lockdown, all the videos on Facebook, hundreds of thousands of views. Yeah, Sean, he has developed into a, a very, very good and outstanding opera singer. Hasn't got the opportunity yet. Uh, is constantly chills, chills now his voice, which goes back to the way I've learned, and he's doing the same. He has never stopped learning, you know what I mean? We'll go on to CJ. CJ, CJ has massive talent if you wanted to tap into it. Yeah. Again, same thing. Uh, he's played in different sports, um, excelled in his football, uh, organised and was with a, 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 um, 
Newbridge Colts, yeah. uh, all the lads from school were involved in it. It was about fun and laughter, and they all got a game, and they did very well in it. And um, CJ then, of course, worked with autistic children initially, uh, and then he went back to college, um, and now he is teaching in schools himself in Port Leash. So he has developed out into a fine young man, has two children, lives in Monster Evan, going very well, and trains, but doesn't train very, very severely, but trains nonetheless. Brilliant, and the two babies. Yeah, Maeve-Anne and Evelyn. Evelyn would be the baby, Maeve-Anne. Yeah. Maeve anne was a very talented girl. She played for Sarsfields at the highest level. As a young woman, at 15, mm. she played senior for Sarsfields. So she had massive talent. Uh, no matter what she put her mind to, athletics or otherwise, she was very fast and explosive. Maeve-Anne then developed into a hairdresser, Peter Marks. She wanted change as well, and like they all did. And she became a teacher of special kids over in Kildare or someplace like that. Honestly. One thing that's permeating through this interview, and I have a little knowledge of a jury, is, and you've mentioned your parents, how much the Loftus family have given to other people. They're altruistic. They're givers, not takers. I know my friend, your nephew, Andrew, and he do it in a very understated way. He's over in America and has been for years and That's he's, right. he's been very successful in construction. But I know any of the guys that went over to Newbridge or over to the States from Newbridge, Andrew looked after and set them up with work. Absolutely. You know, and that team And my brother Paul is the same. Same yeah. when you say that. Anybody and everybody goes over to Paul. And Andrew would have known Paul very well as well. Paul was in um, 35 years maybe at this stage in America he's a chef as well took after my father yeah. and um, my, my final uh, Evelyn we Evelyn. can't, we can't, can't leave Evelyn. Evelyn Evelyn has turned out to be absolutely a great kid yeah. the youngest of the whole lot has learned so much from everybody which is a great thing uh, has developed now into um, manageress of Peter Marks uh, and in that capacity has um, hired uh, Maeve Ann and Geraldine in their capacity Brilliant. So she actually has brought something back and given something I'd back. I'd say Geraldine's still the boss, though. Well, <laughs> Geraldine can hold her own with anybody, as you well know. <laughs> but absolute beautiful insight. How many grandchildren have you, Jerry? Five. A special mention must go to Rawa. What a warrior. Oh, Rawa has come on so well. As you know, she had many little small yeah. errors. But has come big and strong in time. Denise, I have to say, was a Trojan, absolute yeah. Trojan. And when I, I have to admire her because she's worked through thick and thin working with her. And she's a lovely little singer. Yeah. Um, niece, two of her own. lighting candles for oh, her. Oh, she's she was, very, yeah, she's yeah, brilliant, yeah, absolutely yeah. brilliant. And Denise has done a great job there. I have to admire her for that, yeah. Brilliant. You've also encountered adversity, Jerry in terms of none more so than the premature loss of your brothers Pat and Peter. Yes. Two absolutely gifted footballers. Um, Peter Leinster minor captain winner. Absolutely. 1983 and he was part of the great trilogy of games between Moorfield and Sarsfields, Sarsfields in 87 and then Pat an outstanding ah. soccer player. Yes. Yeah, yeah. How have you dealt with that loss? Uh, Peach was a very big loss to me because we were close. He admired me and looked up to me, but yet he was multi-talented himself. Yeah. Peach could have been anything. Yeah. And um, in fairness to him, at the time uh, that he died, he was changing his life into being fitter, healthier, stronger, yeah. taking charge of his son, Paul. Um, he loved him very much. Yeah. Um, whereas... Him and Paddy would have gone on in their own way as well. And, and we, we all did, actually. I have to say, all the brothers and, and things. And Paddy died. He was the oldest. Yeah. And Paddy was, as a young man, Paddy would go to a brick wall. He was the man. If you said to Paddy, go out there and get them, he wouldn't even think about it. He'd be gone. Yeah. Paddy would take it from the head down yeah. playing soccer. Yeah. <laughs> he, there was no in between with Paddy. If he went out to get you... And I remember my brother Noel who was very good at football himself and a left footer. And as you know, there's a shortage of left footers in a lot of games. Yeah, yeah. But they told him the A team were playing the B team and Paddy was kind of going down a little bit and he turned around to Noel and I'll never forget. And he says, brother, I'm just going to give you a word of advice. You're very good at coming down the left wing when you're playing top teams for 
from Nobridge Town. I'm going to give you a bit of advice today. Don't come down as if you own the left wing because I'm going to break you up. <laughs> <laughs> and he nearly did. I watched the game yeah. and Noel came down the wing and Paddy came out as the usual Paddy and went straight for him and took him over. Even Noel. at the height of your success and fame, Jerry, you never left the town that made you. Now, our ancient scholars call that the Coo Cullen Syndrome. How much does the town of Newbridge mean to you? Well, I... I I would say no matter where I went, and I have travelled the world at this stage, mm. I, I've travelled to an awful lot of places. I would say I love Newbridge. I love uh, people like yourself, like Paul, uh, uh, who plays the guitar, and, and, and I like what he does, and, and, and many other people who I've met. I'm, I've met so many people in clubs, and everybody knows clubs are very hard to run, but in fairness to the people that run those clubs, they, went, they go through tick and tin to get success. And it isn't easy because everybody has a different perspective. And, of course, they're going to have because they all come from different levels and different parts of that particular town. And as you know yourself, um, you get your way of thinking from your peers, from your mother and father, from your brothers and sisters. Everybody's character and personality is designed around that eventually, you know. But I think what sport has done for, very, for a lot of people, um, it has brought us together. From Newbridge, I'm a Moorfield man. I have great friends in Sarsfields, but if I played Sarsfields on the team on a football pitch tomorrow, I'd want to kill them. That's just yeah. the way it is. Your nephew's a great athlete. Oh, Con Connor. Connor Tiernan, yeah. yeah. Connor has the same traits as me and could probably emulate me if he focuses on one event. I didn't either, but yeah. he could be, and he has great ability, and a great kid. Um, looks after himself and his family and all his family are fueling into that as well and supporting him which is a great thing because you know yourself yeah. um as i as, as i i have met great lads in the army and i must say this even though uh, there was a bit of discrepancy about the way they treated me i have to say i have met the best and paddy murphy i will give a mention of would have been a mentor of mine paddy murphy won the world champion vet world champion 10,000 metres national champion Brendan Downey a good friend of his with Jerry Kiernan and I knew Jerry very well as well mm. all lovely people all uh, a part of the mix of who I am I learnt from some motivation some um, determination some um, step by step programmes in which I developed myself and they were all very encouraging one final question for you Jerry Baftus your life has been this journey of continued success have you had any regrets? I would say to people about that, and I was asked about it, if you were to ask somebody, would they do anything different? I can assure you, they can't. That's the honest answer. Why? Because in the circumstances that are created in front of us, we can only react in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. So as much as I'd love to say yes, I can't say yes because I wouldn't be honest. Mm -hmm. In the same circumstances, with the same hand of cards, you cannot change anything about your life, but you can address it, face it, and say to yourself, that will never happen again. And move forward with the intelligence that God gave us. And realise that you can have a different life, but you must rearrange your thought process, have a different way of thinking, and move on to your future. Clarify your thought process, and focus on the things that you really want from this world. That's what makes us human. That's what makes us, gives us the challenge of change. If you change the way you think, you can change the way you feel and act. This has been one remarkable story, Jerry Loftus. The man who has always walked amongst his own. Thanks for joining us in the Fireside Chat, Jerry. Thank you for having me. From Paul Winders Productions, The Legion of Larks, The Traveller's Rest and Kelby Developments, until the next time, folks, keep the header blazing. The lark in the morning, she rises off her nest. She goes home in the evening with the jewel on her breast.